So this is Introduction to Kinesiology, uh, KI-200, and it's Lecture 2 of Module 1, uh, the Introduction to the Introduction of Kinesiology. So this is kind of a, an overview of the uh, class. Again, this lecture uh, is um, usually conducted live with uh, menti.com, so don't worry about the code that you see at the top of the screen. Um, any of the questions that present here, I do want you to, to take out a piece of paper, a pencil, or um, uh, just have a, another little Word document opened up, a text or Word document, and just jot down what you might be uh, experiencing or thinking about based on those questions. So. Um, so I had asked you guys in the last lecture, what is kinesiology? And I kind of gave you that, um, the quick rundown of what it means. But the technical aspect of it is, um, and you look at the word kinesiology, ology or logos is uh, the Greek word of study. So psychology, sociology, all those ologies, biology. Um, and then kines or kinesis is uh, the Greek word for movement. So this is the study of movement. And um, particularly, this is the study of human movement. So you can, there's all types of biological and anatomical comparison, understand how a cheetah or a, a horse or a fly or how all these things move. But what makes kinesiology unique and why it currently is the premier um, transfer degree for most of the health sciences is that it's, it is specific to human anatomy. There's no cat or invertebrate or worm or frog. It's all looking at how the human body works. So then the next question then is what type of movement are we looking at? And um, when you think of kinesiology and you think of human movement, the question I want you to, uh, to ask yourself, and just again, this is going to be a discussion board question, is what movement comes to mind? And I'll give you a second to jot that down. And if we were in class here, what the results would be is mostly related to sport. So either exercise, fitness, sport, and and. That is true. About 80 to 90 percent of kinesiology related fields are looking at human movement, getting back to sport performance. But the word performance is, is not just to uh, athletics, but it's also to basic daily function. And we actually look in the field of kinesiology, there's going to be four uh, main areas. There's going to be this term called ADLs, and that's an acronym for activity of daily living. And these are things that you need to do just in your day-to-day -day activity to survive. And I know not tying your shoes is surviving, but these are all like functional activities um, of doing the dishes, tying your shoes, um, hygiene after you use the bathroom, um, being able to feed yourself, and so forth. The second area is exercise, and we look at those as fitness activities. Then we have sport and performance, so like a baseball swing or a swimming stroke or a golf swing. And then we have... Um, expressive communication or arts, right? Looking at dance or basic communication like American Sign Language or even sports related of a referee signals, a hand signals and so forth. So these are the four areas that, are re that require human movement and it's not just sports and performance. Now, um, this is an example from the textbook from chapter one. Um, looking at kinesiology and breaking down the movements into three categories. So you have your symbolic movements up here, you have your supportive movements, and you have your sportive movement. And just for an example, for like the chapter summary, it might ask you to give like two or three examples of symbolic, two or three examples of supportive, and uh, two or three examples of sportive movements, just to allow you to read through that chapter and separate um, the different types, or at least categorize movement, instead of just saying human movement, that it can be subcategorized into three different areas. So the next question is, uh, give some examples of supportive movement. So how would that look? And your discussion board question is going to be, um, what are two supportive movements in your life, two sportive movements in your life, and uh, two, um, you know, two, two, and two. So just take a minute and uh, just look at supportive movement just right now for the moment. And uh, an example for this, and you can use this in your worksheet if you'd like for your assignment, is um, for supportive movement. So not just, but the ability able to just to control your head, right? So you're looking at this computer screen right now. You might be laying down in bed, but if you were in a classroom um, and you didn't fall asleep yet from boredom, you would have to have your head support. So you have to have a certain amount of neuromuscular control, structural stability and integrity, and um, desire to keep your head in that position because you really can't walk very well with your head down. So the head in position is a, uh, a basis for that. 
So when we look at um, the field of kinesiology now, um, not just um, the, what it is, but when we look at human movement, we see that it has profound impact on our interaction with other people, uh, how we as a life form a aspect different cultural components like body language and posture and so forth, and then human physical activity. And, and all of these different domains here are supported not just by kinesiology, but by our social interaction, our biological drive, our cultural components, and in context with kinesiology. So how you move isn't just affected by the structure and the, the aspect. There's many other components that kinesiology has an effect on and is affected by. So in this class, um, we have the field of kinesiology right here, and we have these six subdomains that make up um, our experience of kinesiology. There's actually seven and eight, but they're not necessarily represented here, but we're going to cover them. But in the first aspect, you have um, these realms, and what's interesting with you have um, disciplines of kinesiology that someone's a PhD in kinesiology or movement science or human performance, but you can see that these are made up of these six, seven, eight subdisciplines. There are experts that are just biomechanists. There are people that are just exercise physiologists. There are, are social kinesiologists. There are people that specialize. So what's really interesting about kinesiology is that it's made up of many subdomains that there are also experts in. So it's a rapidly expanding field. It's very diverse. There's quite a bit that goes into this. And, and um, when you decide to pursue your kinesiology degree, um, you might be more interested in one of these subdomains or the other. So that means that every kinesiology degree is not the same. You can have some kinesiology degrees that are more exercise physiology emphasized or kinesiology degrees that are more on developmental or biomechanics and so forth. So just keep that in mind. Um, the modules throughout this course do kind of follow this structure a little bit with the exercise physiology and so forth. The only one missing here is anatomy and phys, but we'll go through all those. And you can see how it becomes more complex. Here's how physical activity or kinesiology is dependent upon these components. And then that you have these sub-disciplines that exist in these different fields like uh, athletic training or physical therapy, exercise science. And so you have then a diversity of different types of vocational fields that come out of the, so here's your main aspect, here's your academic fields, and then here are your vocational fields. And it expands even further in terms of um, what um, basic like areas of interest that might kind of kind of come in so there's quite a different uh, view of these different fields that look from the social aspect from the vocational aspect and from the academic aspect so kinesiology just looking at human movement can be very complex so we start with the with the contextual aspect of history of kinesiology and we're not going to spend so much time with that um, in some classes, they might get into like this person studied this and this person started that, but all of that is just trivial pursuit type uh, goals. But um, looking at kinesiology, looking at human movement has been around since, since the dawn of civilization. Um, when, we, uh, as, when societies were created um, or were evolving or being formed, um, the ability to defend yourself was crucial. And so when you look at war, particularly war that depended upon manual implements, so non-missile weapons, so instead of arrows and bullets, but swords and spears, um, understanding the best way to dispatch your enemy became crucial. And so people were looking at sport for, or looking at uh, human mutant for a long time, more for warfare than for sport. But when you look at the history of sport, particularly the Olympics that started in 776 BC in Greece, these were games that were forged to keep soldiers in better shape so that during times of peace, they didn't become soft and weak. And it, they trained them to become more competitive, more competitive, more competitive, so they can be more effective at their job, which is killing the enemy, right? Um, so you have uh, the Hippocratic Oath. So Hippocrates uh, is considered the father of medicine. Um, he's quoted a lot um, by let food be thy medicine. So he was one of the first to look at that what you're putting into your body affects your body. But he was uh, very much interested in the structure and function of the human body. He came up with the four humors and looked at like bloodletting and was kind of made fun of. But it's kind of interesting now that we use leeches as methods to drain blood to help in a surgical aspects. So it wasn't so off track with that.
the first real area that we're going to focus on is the anatomical and physiological system. So um, we'll look at functional anatomy, which is one domain, and we'll look at exercise physiology. Now this is really no different than anatomy and physiology that you would take as, as a high school advanced course or your basic A and P in uh, school. But when you look at the kinesiology aspect, being looking at static tissue, so looking at the anatomical position or cadaver, um, an anatomy changes based on what it's doing. And so the anatomy that you learn in a normal anatomy aspect is different and not appropriate. For example, um, we look at, let's say, the biceps and say that biceps are only involved in bending the elbow or flexing the shoulder. But we do realize that, and when some people say that when they're training chest or doing bench press, they're only training triceps. But based on our understanding of anatomy, that would be somewhat true. But if you took a class in functional anatomy or anatomy related to kinesiology, you would be able to realize that the biceps are actually involved in the bench press. So these are different things that apply based on how we move in space, right? And so the anatomy in function in this aspect is, is uh, different. So the anatomy and physiological systems, we see here that um, you don't see the kidneys or the liver, but we look at the primary neuromuscular and musculoskeletal systems. And the way that we interpret this pyramid here is that there's a hierarchy of control. And we see that there's movement here. And this is, again, kinesiology study of movement. All movement occurs here at the articular system, which is a fancy way of saying skeletal system. The bones are 100% dependent upon the muscular system, and the muscular system is 100% dependent upon the nervous system. And there's a particular flow of information that's occurring here. And so when we see movement here, um, that movement is a product of all three of these systems working together. Now, I tell students all the time that this is my favorite image and my favorite slide, and the reason why I say that is that this is kind of a roadmap to when we have problems with movement, so my back hurts, or my shoulder hurts, or um, I'm not strong enough with this particular movement or this exercise, we're always observing the movement, right? But when we start to, to try to reverse engineer it or figure out where the problem's at, it can be a muscular thing, the muscle's not strong enough, or it can be a tissue, connective tissue aspect where the joint's not stable enough, or it can be a nervous system thing where the signal isn't good enough. So you can have five people all with the same diagnosed back problem, and they can all be coming from different aspects. And this is what differentiates different specialties in the field. Let's say that person has a articular, a joint issue, and they go see a chiropractor, and they're gonna say that chiropractor was a genius, they took my pain away. And then they refer their friend and say, hey, you got the same back issue, go see them, they're gonna do great, but that person more has like a muscular issue. And this person was probably better served by seeing a massage therapist, but when they saw the chiropractor instead, didn't have as good results. So it just kind of keeps in mind that you as a practitioner, when you get into your field, that movement dysfunctions aren't always coming from the same spot, that it can be a variety of issues that it's coming from. So that's the um, anatomical aspect. The next area we're gonna look at is exercise physiology. And um, this is one aspect of the uh, stress response that we look at. And again, you, human physiology is human physiology, and we'll probably take an, a physiology class at some point, but exercise physiology is looking at extreme situations, particularly um, heat and dehydration status, but most importantly, stress. And stress imposed, self-imposed, aka exercise. There's a misnomer that people say, oh, there's good stress and bad stress, but that's not true. Stress is stress. What's good or bad is your response. And what makes a good response was it, was it within your capability, and if a bad response is it was exceeding your ability. And we look at this um, delicate dance that exists within the fitness industry or performance industry that um, no pain, no gain, go heavy or go hard or go home. All of these are really bad training advices. And really it's a, a delicate dance of just the Goldilocks principle where you wanna have just enough stimulus so that your body is, is forced to change, but not too much where you've exceeded the body's ability to recuperate. So um, the way that I, I explain this in class is that this is your homeostasis or your baseline, your function, and then you expose yourself to a little bit of stress, so let's say exercise, and it actually reduces your capacity. But then what happens is if you have enough nutrition, enough rest, your body actually gains at a new functional level. And so now instead of being down here, your body's here. And then if you impose another training session again, you take one step back, 
and you gain two steps forward and now you're up here and then another training session if you wait too long for a training session you start to uh, decline or if you work out too soon so everyone's so focused on the best workout best thing best exercise but the exercise is only one part of the equation your second part of the equation is do you have enough recovery so it's not just stimulate 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 it's stimulate recuperate stimulate recuperate and the way this journey works and this is just generalized is that you take one step back two steps forward and so you're one step ahead one step back two steps forward when people work out too much they might be taking two steps back or they're working out too frequently to take one step back and only one step forward so it's a, a balance between getting the recovery just as much as the stimulus the next area we look at is biomechanics, and uh, we're, this is looking at forces uh, and how the body kind of in, in incorporates those components. The way that we're going to explore this in this class is we're not going to do any mathematical engineering aspects, but we're going to look at how force enters the body when your foot hits the ground, and we're going to investigate how that happens when the front of the foot hits the ground versus the rear foot, and this gets into barefoot running or heel strike versus forefoot strike, so kind of an exciting area. Um, but almost everything that we look at from a movement perspective is, is a biomechanical analysis, understanding uh, forces and mechanics and levers and torques and moment arms. So it can be very mathematic and very engineering, or it can be very practically applied. Um, the next area we'll look at is motor control and learning. And this is where we start to, to merge what's going on with the brain and versus what's going on with the body. Particularly, we'll look at cognitive performance. So we'll look at subconscious mechanisms that are happening that are outside of our control, and then we'll look at conscious mechanisms that are with our control. But it's basically how do we go from a thought to an actual physical movement, so from a, an arbitrary thought to a tangible component, and um, understanding how hand-eye coordination works, uh, understanding performance under pressure. And this is what then starts to bring us into the next area of sports psychology, Oops, I got ahead of myself. Um, well, let's go one more. Sports psychology, looking at this motivation, mental processing, and understanding how um, you need a certain level of arousal to do really well, but too, mo too much, and you start getting tunnel vision, and you start to choke, right? And the mechanism at play is the ex for physical uh, choking, like not actually choking on something where you need a hymic, but like the where you have so much intensity that you just you just flubbed it, right? How many times have you taken an exam and you've, uh, you, you, in the moment, you're like, oh, I forgot everything. And then you uh, look back at your test the next day and you're like, oh, I knew all those things. Or when you're about to give a speech and, or you're about to do something and you have so much fear and anxiety that you're saying, um, 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 like, like, and you're sweating and you forgot everything, right? That's physical uh, performance arousal. So there's, there's methods that athletes use to calm that down that are the exact same mechanism that you can do, whether it's physical performance or mental performance. Uh, the other area we'll look at is developmental, um, and not just like the developmental progress uh, of acquiring skill sets, but also how do we age gracefully, right? How can we still be 100 years old and kicking butt and not be 60 years old and having to use a cane or a walker? So these are the process of maturing and our aging aspect. And then the last area we're going to look at is, um, uh, so, uh, oops, is a social cultural. So the so how society is viewed, and in particular nowadays, we have so much social media and um, so much dependency on that, and uh, we're kind of a fractured society right now. And What's really neat is even though you're a Cubs fan and someone else is a Sox fan, you might not like each other very much, but you'll just uh, all in play. Um, sports, athletics, movement brings us together as, a, as humanity. Um, the competitiveness that exists between each other, then when you're on the same team, brings you together. Um, so even though you might not be a Cubs fan, but you're a Chicago sports fan, um, you're still going to want Chicago to win versus Wisconsin, unless you're a crazy Green Bay fan like I am, but don't hold that against me. But um, we'll explore um, some of the social aspects and how um, even like the whole aspect of like fat shaming and um, our, uh, our perspectives that we have on movement related or um, visual appearance and what we consider attractive or not attractive, 
um, we'll look at how the biological and social cultural processes go into that. And so it's a kind of an interesting component and something you didn't think of, uh, would think of would be connected with the kinesiology component. So that's really it for um, here, looking at these domains, looking at the anatomy, the, the physiology, the biomechanics. And again, these make up our, um, our domains and then our, our modules for kinesiology. So then we just looked at the uh, domains that make up the, uh, the field of kinesiology. So what I want to look at next here is the, um, how you would use all those domains in particular performance. And so when you look at like trying to increase someone's running speed or running duration, so they're, they're a marathon runner or a sprinter, whatever you want to look at, that it's not just a physiological component, like how well their, uh, their lungs are exchanging oxygen, how well their muscles are able to utilize that, that there's a biomechanical component. There's a, how the tissues are able to handle those forces. There's a mechanics component, how your foot's hitting the ground, where your center of gravity is. There's a, a psychological component, the mental game that's going on between the ears. And in fact, that's where a lot of the um, investment is going right now in uh, higher caliber athletes is this psychomotor or neurological components. And there's a biochemical component, what's happening nutritionally, physiologically in that aspect. Um, so all of these things that go in, and then there's a bunch of other factors that go into uh, increasing efficiency for performance. So it's not just bigger muscle, stronger muscle, it is also uh, technical component, psychological component, and so forth. Um, from an, an academic perspective, um, there are many fields to go into now with the kinesiology degree. Um, you can go into um, your bachelor's degree to get into some of these entry levels. It's actually outdated as of last year. Athletic trainer is now a master's degree, but you used to be able to get a bachelor's degree and become an athletic trainer. Um, you also don't really need a bachelor's degree. You can have an associate's degree or just a certificate to become a fitness trainer. Um, but you can go into many different aspects. So it's kind of a roadmap that kind of shows the, the study. Most people that are getting a kinesiology degree are planning on going on to graduate study. I tell people all the time that the kinesiology degree is by far the best, the best stepping stone degree into physical therapy, chiropractic medicine because of the specificity of human movement, human anatomy. Um, a lot of people pursue a bachelor's degree because they want to get become a personal trainer. Um, I don't know if that's really the best step. Um, the bachelor's degree by itself is not a very good um, terminal degree, meaning that you're not going to have all these job offers there, that people with a bachelor's degree and without a bachelor's degree are probably making the same amount of money as a, as a fitness trainer, a personal trainer. Um, it is needed to go on to these fields, but not necessarily needed to get into these fields here. So, so that's it for this particular lecture, um, and uh, we'll continue with the uh, specifics into the next lecture there.